Okay, uh, good, good evening everyone. We're doing this, uh, this live broadcast to uh, Toronto today. And uh, uh, we will go to speak about uh, a lecture that is called Torah and Science. I made a four hour DVD about it, but we're going to do it today in less than an hour. And then I'll give you some time for questions and answers. Uh, I just want to make sure that everyone there is seeing me because I lost a picture of yours. Yeah, but, uh, uh, I, uh, we're still here. I just turned off the video so the Skype will be smoother. Ah, I see. Uh, we'll oh. turn on the video later when, when we turn on the light. Okay, good. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so uh, since I understand that the audience over there it's not religious yet, or some even trying to start getting closer to uh, religion. Uh, I would like to give a lecture that is really for the first level, for complete beginners. Uh, when we start to give a lecture for beginners, the first question we have to ask ourselves is what is the reason that at least 70% of the Jewish people in the world, from 13.2 million people that we have in the world, why at least 70% of them are not keeping the Torah and the laws of the Torah? That's the question we have to ask. It could be a few possibilities. One is that none of them really is aware of the Torah, or at least most of them. They don't know what the Torah is. They, nobody ever taught them in school what the Torah is. And they grew up and they live free life whenever they are. And that's it. It never bothered them to check. That's one possibility. The second possibility is that some people even went to religious school when they were young. Well, when they grew up, they found out that maybe it's too difficult for them to live in this kind of lifestyle. And they're not interested. They want to do whatever they want. They don't want anyone to tell them what to do. So over the years, they completely forgot about what they learned when they're young. So even if they have faith and, uh, and belief in God and in the Torah, it was forgotten. The only time they'll remember it is when they have a serious problem in life. So maybe for a week they will remember it and then they go back with their life when the problem is over. That's the second possibility. The third possibility over here is, is that people that, uh, you know, heard that there is Torah, there's uh, Judaism, they see a lot of religious people, but they think, ah, it's all nonsense. The religious people live in a dream, they're primitive, they made it up, it's just a culture, you know, everyone added something, and all of a sudden, after a few hundreds or few thousands of years, you have a religion. It started with someone's idea, one faker one day decided to create a group, and he gathered himself some uh, followers, and he gave them all kinds of instructions based on his own opinion. And today, two, three, four thousand years later, this is what it became. It became a whole religion. People in different parts of the world, they keep it, just like any other of the cults. There's more than 80,000 religions and cults in the world today. Apparently, all of them started like that. So Judaism is also like that. Even though Judaism, uh, in reality, in a chronological order, in history, it's the first main religion. There were always idols worshippers before, even the Torah speaks about them in the time of Abraham. There were idols worshippers, so there were cults before Judaism were given to the Jews. But uh, a main religion, it was the first main religion. Later the Christianity started, and then uh, Islam. And actually after Judaism, the first main religion that started was Buddhism. It was 2,400 years ago. So the Torah was given to the Jews 3,323 years ago. And uh, Buddhism started in the time of Buddha 2,400 years ago. And Christianity approximately 2,000 years ago. And uh, Islam less than 1,400 years ago. That's really the main four religions. So one way or the other, we see that uh, many, many times a cult started by story of one person, even in our days people inventing all different kinds of cults all over the world, modern ones, and there are always followers. It starts with 10 and then 50 and then 100 and then 1000. 
and then maybe in a thousand years it can turn into millions with their children, grandchildren, and followers who will join them, especially when all these religions and cults, they put a lot of efforts to do a missionary work. They send missionaries all over to hunt people, to make them join their religion. They put lots of money, like Christians and Muslims, the Christians, the way they do it, by sending missionaries to convince people that the New Testament is a book of God and Christianity is a divine religion. And they send people all over the world and they, they convince people with their smooth talk and by giving them financial aids so, uh, when, they, when they have a problem and enjoy, uh, inviting them to all kinds of events. And slowly, slowly they're gathering more and more followers that join their religion. By Islam, it's more violent. Over there, whenever Islam takes control, they force the people of the place to follow the Islam. And if the people refuse, they just destroy them. They don't give them another option. Either they have to leave the land, or they kill them, one of the two. That's basically how Islam started. There was a Muhammad, one day he came, he claimed that Angel Gabriel gave him the Quran, and from that moment on, he had a bunch of followers, and from that moment on, they went from one person to the other, one family from the other, uh, in the desert of Arabia. And those who refused to turn into that religion, they basically killed them. It started like that and it's continuing like this in these days. A Buddhism, it's a very, very simple idea. There's a person named Buddha. He claimed he saw the light. That's it. You see the light, they have yoga, all kinds of spiritual things, meditation. There's really not that much over there to do. There's no book of laws. There's no restriction. There's no reward and punishment. It's basically a way of life that somebody, one human being invented. You want to believe him, fine. You don't want to believe him, it's up to you. He never brought any evidence that he had any revelation, anything like that. And today, 2,400 years later, there's hundreds of millions of people who follow it. And then you have Christianity. One day, a, a person named Joseph, which was a Jew, uh, he got engaged with a woman named Miriam, who was also a Jew and uh, get engaged, but they're still not moving in together. That's the custom of those days. So he goes away and he comes back after a few months to build a home after he saves some money. And he finds out that she's pregnant and he gets very upset. What's going on? I never touched you. And she made up a story to save her life that she's a virgin. God came to him in a dream and he made her pregnant and this is going to be a holy boy. And uh, the story of Christianity starts with a woman that claimed that she had a dream and God made her pregnant, even though she was a married woman, officially she already had Kiddushin, uh, which is very, very strange. And from that moment on, she had only one option to save her life, because in those days, a married woman who cheated were executed, and with the men that she was with, both of them. It's called the Noef and the Noefet, the Torah say, Moti Umatu, they have to be executed. So in order for her to save her life, she has to make up a story. He wanted her, he didn't want his love to die. So he covered up and that's it. Later they had a boy and they started to tell the story. And after 70 to 300 years after his death, people started to tell stories around him. Nobody ever saw him. None of the first Christian ever saw who he is. It could be a, to a total myth. Maybe this story never even happened. Nobody in the history actually testifies his existence. So between 70 to 300 years after his death, people started to tell stories, and whatever they told, you have to believe. Now what is the problem between all these stories that I just mentioned, when it comes to find the only real religion of God, if there is any religion of God? If there is a religion of God, how would we be, be able to find from 80,000 religions and cult which one of them is the real one? Now, you're not going to sit 500 years and start investigating every religion and read all their books. Obviously, it's impossible. So the first thing you do is you go to the first one. Because most likely the first one is more authentic than the others who try to imitate the first one. Not necessarily, but logically that's usually how it is. So you go and you check the first one, and then you go to the second main one, and the third, and the fourth, and you begin to compare. The problem that the Christians have is that they claim that the same God gave a second book, the God that gave the Jews the Torah in Mount Sinai 1300 years before J.C. was born. 
He is the one who gave them the New Testament. So it's the old one and the new one by the same author, which is the same God. And in that case, they put themselves into a very, very serious problem. Why? In order for them to prove that the second book is divine, he can never ever contradict in any way the first book, because it's the same one who gave the book. If I write a book, part one, and then I write part two, the names have to be the same name. The people in the story have to be the same people. The event in the first story has to continue from where they stop. There cannot be any contradiction in dates, in names, in marriages, in status of people. I mean, once you have one human error, then it shows you right away that the second book is fake. It was never given by God, because we expect this God, by giving us a book after he created such an amazing world, we expect him not to make human errors that people, silly people, sometimes make. By God, it's either perfect or it's not from God. There's no in-between. So when we read the New Testament, we find in every chapter human errors. Now that we only find human errors, we find ridiculous human error in a level of kindergarten or maximum first grade. Is it possible that God would write such a silly book with so many mistakes? It takes less than an hour, maximum an hour, to know that the New Testament never ever was written by God. Impossible. It cannot be. Because they have geographical mistake, mathematical mistake, historical mistake, uh, stories that, don't, that make no sense whatsoever. Therefore, this book de definitely wasn't given by God. Well, same story with Islam. You go to the Quran, you find contradiction, problems, human errors. And it's very interesting because the Muslims never denied that the Jews received the Torah from God in Mount Sinai, just like the Christians. So the Quran has to continue from where the Torah stopped. When they're speaking about Abraham and Sarah, it's the same Abraham and Sarah from our Torah. When they speak about Pharaoh in Egypt, the king of Egypt, it's the same Pharaoh. But there are, there are mistakes in the Quran. For instance, they take Pharaoh and they take Haman, which was born almost a thousand years later in history, and they fake a conversation between Pharaoh and Haman, two wicked people that are mentioned in Judaism, the writer of the Quran wanted to fool us, so he pretended that there was a meeting between Pharaoh and Amman, which never ever could take place in history, because the last Pharaoh died about a thousand years almost before Haman was even born in Persia, and he was in Egypt and he was in Persia. They just copied from the Tanakh, there's 24 books in the Tanakh, and they did not know that Megillat Esther was almost a thousand years after the Torah was given to Moshe in, us in Mount Sinai. So obviously there's human errors here, and many other human errors in the Quran. That's not what we came here to talk tonight. I just use it for five, ten minutes for the people to know how do you exam and inspect a book to know if it's divine or not. So the rule is, if there is one mistake in a book, one human error, then you'll know right away this is not a divine book. Now when we review the Torah, it's, since the Torah was given until now, nobody ever found any mistake in the Torah. The Torah is the only book in history that have many, many prophecies to the future. The Torah describes what's going to happen in a thousand years, in two thousand years from the time the Jews received the Torah. The Torah speaks about knowledge in nature that only the creator of the world was able to write. No scientist or any professor or any genius person was able to know all the fish that lives on all the oceans and the rivers. It's impossible. Even a million people together will not be able to testify what exists in the ocean and what doesn't exist. No one would be able to give promises on certain species that we will never be able to find uh, in, ever in the water or that we're always going to find the same ones in the water. No one in the old days had any knowledge about the galaxies, the number of the stars, and we find in the Torah that the Torah gave us a number of trillions of trillions of stars in a generation there was not even a primitive telescope. So how did the Torah know that there is so many trillions of stars when there was actually no way to know? There was no NASA, no satellites, no spaceship, uh, no telescope, nothing whatsoever. So obviously we see that the Torah has inside information that was only 
able to be written by the creator of the world. But the Torah also have a huge advantage in all the 80,000 religions and courts who started after the Torah was given. What's the advantage? All the religions and all the cults always starts and will always start with a story of one person. One person come and he say a story. Does he ever bring a witness with him to testify that everything he says is true? I really saw the angel give Muhammad the Quran? Never. I actually saw what Mary dreamed? Never. None of these fakers who started a fake religion are interested to take any partners and lose from their glory and fame to other people. But there is another reason why nobody ever brought any witness. Why is it? Because if you bribe few witnesses to lie and to testify a false testimony, for instance, if Muhammad would pay 10 people and would give them a page and would tell them read the story and learn it by heart. And later when we fake that angel gave me the Quran, all of you have to swear that you were there and you saw the light coming and he puts the book in my hand or he tells me what to write, whatever the story is. And all of you, people would ask you questions, make sure your questions comply with each other. And he gives the max amount of money and the story now is a thousand times more convincing than one person come from the desert and he doesn't have any witness. So why didn't he do it? It wasn't a stupid person. Obviously he was able to fool so many people and force others. So why didn't he bring some witnesses, even fake ones, to make his story much more solid? The answer is, when you convince witnesses to lie, you're always going to be in their hand. They can always blackmail you. Whenever they want money or anything from you, they come and say, give me this, give me that, and if you're not giving it to me, I'm going to tell the, the people about your lie. So that means it's just a matter of time until your story and your lie will come out to the world and you're going to be mem memorized as the biggest crook in history. So none of them wanted to take ever a risk. That's why all the religions started with a story of one person that nobody ever saw. So right away, it starts with a 50% doubt. Did it happen or not? 50% doubt without a doubt. Everyone agree, even the Christians admit that nobody saw Mary having a dream. And the Muslims also, in their books, they testify that Muhammad came by himself. Same thing Buddha that he claimed he saw the light, nobody ever was near him to see this light or to see him seeing the light. Or any one of the cults, the same story, always one person, and he convinced all the others that that's what happened. All you need is five, six people to believe in you, and then you begin to, to form a group, and then it's expanding over the years. But the Torah is a different story. Why? because millions of Jews stood around Mount Sinai when God spoke to Moshe. Every one of them heard the voice of God. Every one of them saw Moshe go up to the mountain for 40 days and coming back after 40 days with the Ten Commandments and the Torah. And every one of the Jews is a part of the actual Torah. Let me explain what I mean. When you read the New Testament, the New Testament, as I said before, was given to many, many generations after J.C. died. So the people who received the book, the first, the first people who started to write the book, John, Matthew, uh, Mark, uh, Luke, all these books, the evangelists, they gave it to the people. The people who received those books have nothing to do with the story. They are the audience. They are receiving a book. They are not a part of the movie. They are not a part of the book. So they receive a book, they tell them a story about somebody who died 100 years ago or 200 years ago, and they, they follow the story and they decide if they want to follow and believe in it or not. The Torah, however, is a different story because at least 70-80% of the Torah, it's events that happen to the people who receive the Torah. You cannot lie to the people by telling them, by telling them a false event that happened to them because they know better than you what happened to them. I cannot come to a million people and tell them God gave me this Torah and he told me to give you this Torah and all of you have to follow me, I'm the prophet, I'm the leader. And when they read the book, they see that every page in this, in this book describes what happened to them. They were in Egypt, they used to be slaves, 
the Egyptians used to torture them, and then God made miracles and all kinds of plagues happened in Egypt, and every firstborn died, and God made a miracle, and the, the, the Red Sea split, and the Jews went through, and the Egyptians drowned, and bread is falling from heaven, and so many miracles that each one of them looks, it's against all odds. Now, the people who receive the book, it's a very, very simple common sense. Everyone would agree that when you come to a secular person and you ask him, I want you to become fully religious, especially in Judaism, which, which is not an easy religion to keep. There are many, many laws and traditions. So if you come to a secular Jew and you tell him, tomorrow morning I want you to become Haredi, fully orthodox, from A to Z, and he will ask you why, so you will tell him that's the truth and that's it. Start keeping the laws. What's the chance it would happen? Maybe, maybe if you're lucky, maybe one out of a thousand would agree. Everyone else would laugh at you. You're telling me to keep it just because you believe in it? I don't even, I'm not even interested to read it. That's what's really happening. So the question we have to ask, how millions of people all of a sudden, overnight, became fully orthodox? How all these traditions and laws that most of them looks very strange to human logic, how all of a sudden millions of people started to keep the tradition and transfer it to their children, and it's going from generation to generation, if when they received the book, they had to read the entire story of what happened to them and to their fathers and their grandfathers, and all the events that describe in the Torah actually happened to them. Now, let's think logically. If one of the miracles that describe in the Torah, there's 100 miracles in the Torah, each one is against all odds. If they receive the book, they have all the reason in the world not to keep the book. They're not interested to become religious. They want to be free. Like most people always wanted to be free. Until today, nothing has changed. Human psychology is always the same. So what reason they have to cooperate with Moshe? Moshe supposedly is their biggest enemy. If he gives them now a book that claim that God gave it to him, and from this moment on you're not allowed to steal, you're not allowed to cheat, you're not allowed to do all kinds of things, this food is good, this food is not good, uh, marriages are limited, not everyone you can marry, uh, there's all kinds of restrictions that they were not aware of. So all of them now have to live completely different than yesterday. They have all the reason to fight against Moshe how they will get rid of him in five minutes, all they have to do is to find one mistake in a book. Because once you find one mistake in a book, everyone would know right away that this book is not divine, because God doesn't make mistakes. So let me give you an example. I had a few years ago a debate with a Christian priest, a professor for Christianity. You can see it on my website. And it became very famous worldwide. And in close to the end of the debate, I ask this priest, I ask him, tell me if uh, we find a mistake in a book that claimed to be the book of God, do we all agree from that moment on that that's it, it's not a divine book, it was a fake book? He say yes, because we both agree that God doesn't make mistakes, he agree with me. Then I say to him, in this case, please explain to me, how does it say in the New Testament that the cave of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is in a city of Nablus, Shechem, when every fool knows it's in the city of Hebron, until this day. It's always been there. All the generation, all the history books, all of them describe where it is. Every day in a history, people are going to pray in a site, one of the holiest sites in the world. It's not only only for Jews, it's only for Muslims and for Christians and for many other Gentiles. So this was one of the busiest sites in the world. Everybody knows where it is. And all of a sudden, the writer of the New Testament made a critical mistake like I said before, in a level of Kingdom Garden, and he wrote that this cave, it's not in Hebron, it's in the city of Shechem. So when I told it to him, he wasn't even aware of it. He told me, impossible. Where do you have such a thing in the New Testament? So after speaking to him, I found the source, I showed him the source in front of his eyes in my computer, and he almost fainted. And that's where he basically surrendered. That was like, you know, the punchline, and, and he said, you put me in a hole, I don't know how I'm going to get myself out of there. So I say to him, I just proved to you that your religion is man-made religion. It's not a divine religion. 
Therefore, it doesn't obligate anyone to anything. It's full of errors. And there's no point of wasting a minute on it. So he said, he didn't say no. He said, but my heart would not let me leave it. It was very good to me over the years, being religious in Christianity. So I say to him, we are not talking about illusions and infatuations and dreams. We are talking the truth, reality. Is it the divine book? No. It makes you feel good. Drugs also make people feel good and it's bad. It's just an illusion. And that was basically the end of the debate. So the same thing I'm saying here today. The people who receive the Torah, they have all the reason in the world not to receive the Torah. They're not interested to become religious. Millions. So all they have to do is to find one mistake. Now they're opening the Torah and they see the, the, the creation of the world. The Torah described the creation of the world in six days. In the seven days God rested. And then after that he described the genealogy of Adam and all the people and Noah and the flood and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And then Jacob with his 12 tribes, they go to Egypt, 210 years of slavery. And that's really where the story begins. The Jews come out of Egypt, and now they're receiving the Torah seven weeks after the exodus of Egypt. This is these days. Pesach just, was just two weeks ago, and we have a few more weeks to go to Shavuot. Shavuot is the holiday of receiving the Torah. So it's seven weeks between Pesach and Shavuot. That's exactly the period that the Jews walked in the desert to Mount Sinai from Egypt. So now, when the Jews opened the scroll, the Torah, for the first time, and they started to read that in Egypt, all over the water, it was all blood. All it needed to, to say, one of the Jews would raise his hand to Moshe and say, Excuse me, Moshe, with all due respect, you're telling us that God gave you this book. We were all in Egypt, and we didn't see that the Nile became all blood or any other river. We didn't see anything like this. All the water were pure and clear, and that's it. So where you brought up this nonsense from? And the next question would be, where did you see millions and billions of frogs all over Egypt or grasshoppers? Where did you see hell? Where did you see bad animals? Where did you see every firstborn dying? We didn't see all that. Now it says that we came out of the, uh, the Egypt, the Red Sea split. We went through and the Egyptian drowns. We didn't see that. It's a dream. It's a movie. It's fiction. It never happened. How can you tell us that God gave you this book when every other sentence here is a lie? No one would ever agree to listen to the instructions in this book when all these stories were turning in, in one moment into a complete fairy tale. No one would agree. No one is that stupid. Even today you find the, the dumbest person in the world and you tell them, God gave me this book, follow it. And he reads that the Twin Towers collapsed in Brooklyn, not in Manhattan or in Chicago. So he would say to you, excuse me, I wasn't in Chicago. It was in Manhattan, in New York. You say, no, but God gave it to me. That's what it says. You would know right away. God never gave it to you. So if the next line would say that you have to keep Shabbat, you're not allowed to create fire on Shabbat, what motivation he would have to listen to this law when one sentence before it, he just read that the Twin Towers collapsed in Chicago? Obviously, no one would agree. Nevertheless, millions of people, everyone together. And many of you probably don't know that until 200, 230 years ago, almost all the Jews in the world were religious. If you read a little bit history, all the exiles, whenever the Jews were in the Arab countries, in the European countries, it was almost impossible to find a secular Jew. All Jews had a cover on their head, all of them had beard, all of them had tzitzit. The only court was the rabbinical court. There was no secular court like today in Israel and other places. All the meat was glad kosher. It was only by a kosher Jew who slaughtered the animals according to the Torah. Everything was according to the Torah. People used to go to the synagogue. Everything was happening. Synagogue was like a, like a social club of the community. Everything was taken care of there. Parties, Brit Mila, Bar Mitzvah, weddings, everything. All over the world. Until the Ascala movement started in Europe by Moshe Mendelssohn, and he decided that now it's time that Jews will start to go to non-Jewish colleges. And in his generation, all his sons left the religion and married Christian girls and converted to Christianity. In his own life, this is what happened to him. And 
later, about 60 years after him, about, excuse me, about eight years after him, it was Theodor Herzl, and he went to the Zionist Congress, and he had the plan to take us to Uganda. We didn't care about the Holy Land. He just wanted a, a political solution to the Jews. They have no country. So, you know, that's how it all started. And the people who came to Israel, the first one in 1880, were all ultra-ultra-Orthodox Ashkenazi Jews from Europe, with beards, with peot, black hats. They all came and they bought Petah Tikva, Dganya, Rishon Lezion, were all rabbis from Europe who left their comfortable life in Europe and they came to Israel when there was few Arabs, it was all swamps. They bought all the land for peanuts because it was all swamps and people were dying from malaria and they bought it from the Arabs who did not believe that they could be so stupid buying hundreds of acres of yards over there when it's all swamps. There's nothing you can do over there. You can grow trees. There was a curse on the land. If you know a little bit of history, you can read. It's all in the history book of Israel. So really, when somebody asks you who started the state of Israel, who really is in charge that the Jews returned to Israel after 1950 years when they were in, in exile after the destruction of the Second Temple, the answer is the ultra-Orthodox Jews that came from Europe. They are the one that, thanks to him, we have a land. Not the communists who came later. Later, when the communists found out that there's already six, seven cities that are owned by Jews in Israel, they started to come from Russia. The only difference was that they were not only not religious, they hated religion very much. They were communists. And they came with the ideas of Lenin, and they met the Histadrut, the Zionist Histadrut, with the red card, and they wanted to make Israel a country like Europe. No Torah, no, no, no religion, to look like the Goyim. If you have some of the movies, what was the plan? And that's how it was. And later they took control of Israel because they became the majority. And from then on, Israel is a secular state. The problem for them is that in the last 25 years, there's close to one million Jews who made tshuva, became religious. Most of them in Israel, some of them in the United States, and some of them in other countries. But there's a repentance movement now in Israel, which is very, very strong. 20, 30 years ago, there was hardly any synagogues. There's some old one for the old people, and there was really hardly, there's no activity. Today, there's hundreds of hundreds of yeshivot with hundreds of people who sit and learn. These people, five, 10 years ago, were all secular, and now they're all very religious, and it's growing, and they have children, and the, the amount of religious people is growing more and more and more. There's, yeah, my, there's more than 100,000 people who sit and learn Torah. That's why now it's becoming a very serious problem in Israel that the secular people cannot tolerate anymore how there's so many yeshivot, so many synagogues, so many mikvaot, and the religious people are taking over cities and places and develop, and it's, it's, a, it's becoming a cultural, cultural a, a, a fight between the religion and the secular people. Let's conclude so far what I say is like this. In order for us to know that the book is 100% divine, the first rule is that the book doesn't have any human errors. After we examined the book and we didn't find any human error, it's still not a guarantee that God gave it. Maybe it was a very, very, very smart human being that was so careful, and he was so, such a genius, and he knew all the details in history, and everything, and he was able to write it. However, if we find in this book divine information, that we know that even a superhero, a super genius, or even 5,000 genius people combined, with any budget you give them, they will not be able to know, because the, this knowledge in the book is above human ability, that's when you have to begin to realize that this book can never be written by people, only by the creator of the world. So let me give you a few examples of what I mean. The Torah says to the Jews, this is what you're allowed to eat in order for it to be kosher. Everything you catch by the oceans, by the water, has to have two signs in order for it to be kosher. It has to have fins and scales. Fins and scales. If it has fins and scales, it's kosher. If it doesn't, then it's not kosher. So, 
we go into the oral Torah, the written Torah has no meaning without the oral Torah which was given to Moshe together, combined. The written Torah is very brief, and when you want to know what every verse and every word means, you must go to the oral Torah that was given together as a one unit to explain all the laws and all the secrets and every, all the details of this law. Because in a written Torah, you don't have any description of anything, just the name of the commandment, that's it. One sentence. You know, at that, tochlu mi kol asher vamai, this is what you're allowed to eat, kol asher lo snapir vekaskeset, tochelu. Everything that has fins and scales, you're allowed to eat. But there are so many things that you have to learn around, and none of it appears in a written Torah. Or the written Torah say, you have to circumcise every firstborn, and the eighth day, you have to cut his orla. Without the oral Torah, nobody would know what orla is. Everyone would have to guess. One would think maybe it's ear, one would think it's the air, one thing it's a nail. Everyone has a different opinion because the written Torah did not tell us where in the body we have to cut. It just gave us a name that nobody heard before. You have to cut the orla. Nobody would know. And what happened if the baby is yellow? When do you do it? In the day or in the night? You're allowed to do it at night or you're not allowed to do it at night? What happens if the, if the baby's brother died already because they have, the, the blood is not clogged? Some people have this problem. Are you allowed to do it to the next baby also? Or is this meat from this mitzvah? Can it be done by a non-Jew? Can it be done by a woman? There's thousands of questions and laws that connect only to this mitzvah which called Brit Milah. Brit, it's a covenant between us and God. None of it appears in the written Torah. The written Torah says someone who doesn't circumcise his baby, this baby is not a Jew, it's an Arel. He cannot join the Jewish nation. So it's a short, this connection between him and God. So such an important mitzvah and the written Torah will not tell us how to do it, with what tools, where to cut, how to cut, what blessing to make. No, nothing, nothing whatsoever, how can it be? Every fool understands there's, there's missing information. Where is it? The answer is, it's all in the Oral Torah. That's why the written Torah already speaks about the Oral Torah in few places. The written Torah says, Ele atorot, torot meaning in Hebrew plural, atorot vachukim vamishpatim veluchot haeven asher samti biyad Moshe biyar Sinai. Those are the Torahs and the laws and the sentences and the boards of stone that I put in the hand of Moses in Mount Sinai. So Torahs, more than one. What is it? The written and the oral. So now, if we go the, to the oral Torah about the verse, everything from the word there must have fins and scales, we find that the oral Torah tells us a very big secret, that a person was unable to write ever. What does it say? It says like this, everything in the water that have fins, that have scales, must have fins. There are certain things that have fins but don't have scale. But if something have scales, for sure, it will always have fins. So if there are creatures in the water, species that have fins, and they have a smooth body like the dolphin, like the shark, you don't need to be God to write it in a book. It's enough you see a dolphin or a shark once in your life, and you know there's some fish with smooth skin. That's it. You don't need to be, to, to be God to know it. It's not a discovery. But the second part of the sentence, it's a divine information. What is it? It says everything that has scales must have fins. You will never find anything, anything in history that have uh, scales and did not have fins. So now I want to ask you a question. 72% of the world is water. How many things, how many things are moving inside the water? More than 40,000 different kinds of fish and all kinds of scorpions and turtles and horses and snakes. So many billions and things moving in the ocean simultaneously. 72% is water. 12 kilometer depth, so far they found. There's much, much more deeper depth in the oceans, but there's lots of pressure, so it's very hard to go there. But one way or the other, we all know there's no human being in a history 
that was able to watch 72% of the world, all the water, you know how wide is the ocean, and to watch every inch of the water simultaneously all over the world and to write in a book, this species doesn't exist. How does he know? Maybe when he check over here, he moved to a different side of the world. There's no way to prove what doesn't exist. You can prove what exists by showing it. But you cannot swear that this is, doesn't exist. So now in the Torah it says that everything that has scales will always have, will always have fins. So all we have to do is to find one snake in the water that will have scales and it finish with the tail and that will be the end of Judaism, the end of everything. Why? Because the Torah says if you found scales in the body and you didn't find fins, that will be the first human error. And then we would know that God never gave the Torah. Let me give another example. The oral Torah say that the Western world will never collapse after the second temple destroyed. It says in uh, Shira Shirim, in Kotlenu, Shira Shirim is one of the books of the Tanakh from 24 books. And it says, here is the wall, our wall, standing. So the Midrash, which is a part of the Oral Torah, it says why the Western wall will never collapse. Because God sworn that he will protect this wall from any problem and will never collapse. So what could be easier than knocking down a wall? Especially if you know history, the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians and it had four walls around it. The Babylonian camps and they knocked down the walls, but they did not touch the western wall. Then the Greeks came. That's the story of Hanukkah. The Greeks came, they came to Bet HaMikdash, they occupied it. They did not knock the western wall or, you know, it's still standing. Then the Romans came. They destroyed the second temple completely. Somehow they left the western wall. There were hundreds of hundreds of wars where the wall is. The Fatamin, the Saljukim, the Muslims, the, the Armenian, the, the Arabs, the Persian, the so many empires who occupied the place and had horrible disaster wars over there. Somehow the wall is still standing. There was a massive earthquake a few times in Jerusalem. All the houses collapsed, the western wall is still standing. Not that many people know that the Western Wall has no cement that putting the bricks together, and the bricks are very, very big. All you have to do is to shake the ground severely, and they will, they're supposed to slide on the head of the people there, because it's just standing by the weight, but the walls are still standing. Not that many people know that when the Arab came about 1,300 years ago to build their mosque there, the gold mask, that's where the holy temple used to be. It's no coincidence why they came over there to do it. When they came to build the mosque, they had two, two options. One, the, the mountain was very, very high. And they, want, they have to make the mosque very high. This is the Muslim law, that the mosque has to be the highest in town. And they, knew, they realized that the old people won't be able to climb 10, 15 floors to go all the way up. So they didn't know what to do. They say, we have to make the, the land of Jerusalem, the floor, we have to bring it up. Now, I want to ask you a question. What's easier? To shave the mountain? It's 400 meter by 400 meter. To take about five, uh, 600 workers with shovels and make them work a week. They take all the sand out and they lower the height of the mountain. So if the mountain was uh, 30 meter high, from the way we know it now, it will go down to 15 or to 10. You understand? It's going to be a lot lower. So you can lower it as much as you want. Now what's easier, to lower 400 by 400 mountain, or to increase, to make the entire land around it, of the entire city of Jerusalem higher. So if you ever went to Jerusalem and you go under the ground, to the tunnels there, they will show you that they decided to make Jerusalem higher. So they made arches, and then they built another floor, and they made arches again, and they built another floor, and on top of it they built their homes, which is very interesting. They walked 20 times more than what they should have walked. The question is, 
how, how they were for, so foolish. It was a lot easier to shave the mountain and make it lower. Why does it have to be so tall? The mountain can be smaller and on top they'll build the mask. There's only one problem. If they would shave the mountain from the top, then the western wall, which is on the side of the mountain, would have to be lower and lower until it disappeared completely. And the Torah promise the wall will never fall. It will always remain in a present language. In a ze omed. Here it is standing. So whenever you read the Torah, the Torah is eternal. It will never be changed. One letter in the Torah will never be dismissed. Ever. So you read in the Torah, it says, here is the wall and must be a wall. Now tell me please, what human being, in case you have a doubt who wrote the Torah and you think a person did it, what human being will take such a risk writing that a wall that it takes one or two hours to knock down will never ever collapse in history? Doesn't he know that the other three walls were knocked down in minutes? And this wall is just a matter of time until the enemies of Israel will knock it down? Why will it take such a risk to write such a prophecy when it's not in his hand? The answer is, it's not a man. It's a divine prophecy. And 2,000 years later, we see that, as usual, it was always right. There are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in the Torah and thousands of prophecies in the Tanakh. You don't find one prophecy in the Quran. The Muslim call Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad. Not one prophecy in the entire Quran. Besides prophecies that they copy from the Tanakh. The name of Yechezkel, Yeshaya, Jeremiah. That's not considered a prophecy. You and I can also copy it to our diary. Let's not make us a prophet. We are talking authentic, new prophecies by Muhammad, none. He did not try to predict the future, not even once. Why? Because he knew he's not a prophet. He knew he's lying to the people about the Quran. He knew he never got it from God. And obviously he doesn't know what's gonna happen in a hundred years from now. So why make himself look like a fool? When the time of his fake prophecy would come, everyone would know he was a liar. That would be the end of their religion, and his memory will be de destroyed for eternity. So he did not give any prophecies. The question we have to ask, why they call him Prophet Muhammad, but he never gave even one tiny prophecy. Not to talk about all the mistakes in his book. Not that many people know that he had many wives. Four of his wives had each one of them a different Quran in his lifetime. How many different versions the Quran has today? Hundreds of versions, hundreds. The Quran in Kuwait, and the Quran in Iraq, and the Quran in Iran, and the Quran in Malaysia, and the Quran in Israel, they all have differences. Some minor and some substantial differences. Now, if the book is divine, everybody understands that if one letter is erased or, or added to this book, it makes it human. That's not a divine book anymore. There's interference of human errors. Uh, the Jewish law say that when you write a Sefer Torah, it has 304,805 letters. If you missed one letter, or one letter touched the other, which means two letters became into one, this Torah is not kosher and doesn't have any holiness in it. When the Sefer Torah is holy, it's kosher, you're not allowed to ship it from Israel to here in a box or in a suitcase. No, you have to hold it. And you have 10 people have to walk with you. So how do they ship all the Sifre Torah, all of them written in Israel? There's thousands who were shipped to America. How they ship it? They don't, just don't finish the last word or the last sentence. They leave it open. Once one letter is missing, the Torah is just a piece of paper. Once you conclude the last letter, the divine form of the text has completed. Just like in the internet, if you have an address, let's say you have 50 letters in the address, and, one of, and in between there's a dot. And you did everything correct, but the dot is missing. The computer will not enter that site. Only one dot, or you made an extra space by mistake, it won't open it. Torah, it's either 100% divine or it's zero, it's nothing. So by then, I said to the priest, you have more than 150,000 different versions of the New Testament in Christianity. 150,000 different books when there's only one Torah all over the world. When the Jews had no connection between one continent to the other. The Jews of Asia, the Jews of Africa, and the Jews of Europe, 
They did not know of each other. It's thousands of years that they're in exile. They didn't know. There was no internet, telephone, cameras, ways to communicate like today that you can speak to your parents on Skype or I can give lectures to Canada on Skype. Those days are new. None of it existed hundreds of years ago. So the Jews, when they finally gathered in Israel 60, 70, 80 years ago, they all brought their Torah and their mezuzah and tefillin and everything was the same. Same Brit Milah, same tefillin, same Kiddush, same, same laws of Shabbat, same everything. Same Torah. The one who came from Russia and the one who came from Syria, the Arab Jew and the Russian Jew, standing one next to each other, look completely different, speak completely different, eat completely different food, dress completely different, even have different names, opening the Torah scroll, letter by letter, 304,805 letters identical. Now, you have to remember that the Gentiles, the enemies of Israel, were always after the Jews to destroy them and their religion. Always. Antisemitism, it's an epidemic. Always been, and unfortunately it will always remain. So it always bothered the Goim, or at least the majority of them, that the Jews are religious in their religion. So they did everything they can to make all kinds of decrees, like the Greeks, the Romans, the Philistines, that the Jews will not practice Judaism. So this is a religion that everyone, to, everyone wanted to destroy. It remained 100% divine as it was in Mount Sinai. And their religion, which was completely free, nobody wanted to destroy Christianity. They had freedom, Islam is freedom and power. And they made thousands of thousands of mistakes. And I asked the priest, I told him, tell me please, if God gave you the New Testament, like you claim, and you have, two, I mean, 150,000, since then I updated my information, it's more than 200,000 copies of the New Testament. If there are 200,000 different texts, which each one is different than the other, even if God gave one of them, really gave, it's gone from the world. We will never know which one was the authentic holy one. So therefore, how are we going to know which one to follow? If from 200,000 versions, only one of them is divine and all the other ones are human errors. Even if we want to be Christian religious people, it's impossible, impossible to be. And I gave him an example. If I take a diamond that worth a hundred million dollars and I, and I come to a con convention and all of you knew in advance that I'm going to present my amazing diamond and you made an exact imitation of my diamond a month in advance. And when I presented my diamond to you, all of you took all your fake diamond that were $10 each, and you all threw it in my face. And I got scared, so my diamond fell on the floor. And now I look at the floor and I see a hundred diamonds, which all of them look the same. But only one of them worth $100 million. It's the one I had in my hand a minute ago. But now it got mixed with the other 99 or the, hundred, the, hundred, the other 100 fake ones. And I cannot tell the difference. So even if one of them really worth a hundred million dollars, it doesn't worth anymore. Because we will never know which one is the one. So each one of them, nobody would pay a hundred million for it. Because maybe it's worth only ten dollars. So it's gone from the world. And of course, you didn't have an answer for it. So this is just to show you the difference between a fake religion and a real religion. The interesting part is that Christianity has close to two billion people. And Islam a billion and a half, and Buddhism hundreds of millions, and Hinduism hundreds of millions. And how many Jews are in the world? 13.2 million. Now, I don't know if you know, but we are one of the oldest nations in history that have a history. Actually, no other nation has a longer history than us. Our history goes back to the time of Noah, 4,200 years ago, when the world was destroyed with a big flood. And the world started from eight people, Noah and his wife, and six people, his three sons and three daughters. One of his sons, his name was Sam, Shem. The ones who were born from Sam are the Jews. Someone who hates the Jews, they call him anti-Semite. Anti-Semite. Why? Because we came from Sam, the son of Noah. And Yefet, in English, is Jeff. He went to Europe. Yefet means Yofi, beauty. They got the beauty over there. And Ham means hot. 
They went to Af he went to Africa, where it's very hot, where all the black people live in Africa. That's how the world started, after the flood. And the Torah started to give the genealogy and the descendants of every family. How each one went to the east, to the south, to Greece, to Cyprus, to Canaan, which is Israel, to Egypt. How all the nations moved from one place to another. So we know the history. And it's very interesting. We started in the same generation like the Chinese people. Sam was the uncle of China. Sini, Sin in Hebrew means China. Sini means Chinese. Shem, Shem was the brother of Ham. Sini was the grandson of Ham. So Shem was, you know, uh, 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 the Sini was the son of the nephew of Shem. So it was in the same generation. They saw each other. How is it possible there's close to 2 billion Chinese in the world? and only 13.2 million Jews when we started in the same generation. And on top of that, the Chinese have restriction on birth. They're not allowed to have more than one kid in China. And Jews never had restriction on birth. The opposite, the, the Torah encouraged to give birth. So we should have been at least 3, 4, or 5 billion Jews. How we turn into 13.2 million Jews? Two reasons. One, assimilation, intermarriage. The Torah said, we're not allowed to marry any other nation. We didn't listen to God, and we constantly marry the Goyim. We see every generation all over the world, America, Canada, Europe, Israel, everywhere. So that makes us always less and less and less. We're not staying like the Chinese only stay with themselves in China, the same place, and they marry each other. But there's a reason which is even more severe. What is it? All the other nations live according to the law of nature. There's only one nation who lives according to a spiritual laws, not physical laws. Of course, the law of physics applies to us because we have a body, but we are mainly going by a divine, uh, divine provision, divine providence, and divine supervision, and all the things that relates to spirituality. Why? Because the Torah say that in the Holy Land, rain is according to our sins or mitzvot. If we're righteous, God bless the land, the rain comes on time, we have what to eat, etc. If not, it could be problems, no rains, and people can starve. So we see in America, every week you have rain. But in Israel, it's depend on how people behave. That's why we have to pray for rain. In, in history, there was always praise for rain. Also wars. The Torah says, when you listen to me, I make your enemies leave you alone. And if they decide to attack you, they have a free choice. I don't interfere with their choice. Then I will make you always win against them. Hashem ilachem lachem ve'atem tachrishun. You see it still, and I will fight for you and destroy them. But when you don't listen to me, they'll destroy you. And if you learn history, you see, even in the Torah I describe. When the Jews were righteous, they win. When they're wicked, they lose. And that's re repeat and repeat and repeat. Also, the Torah said a prophecy that it's against all odds. No person was able to predict such a thing. The Torah said, I'm going to spread you in all the nations. You're not going to sit in one place. I will spread you all over the world, God said to the Jews. והפצתי אתכם בעמים ונשארתם במתי מספר. Only few of you will survive. Few of you, few of few, very very little will survive. Less than a percent of a percent. And how, how the writer of the Torah was able to predict such a bizarre prophecy. You know, how did he know? I mean, how do you know what will turn out of a nation? Billions or trillions or whatever, how do you know? They're always going to be less than anybody else. And another place it says in the Torah, I loved you, not because you are the biggest nation. The opposite, because you are the smallest nation from all nations. That's a verse in the Torah. How did he know that we will be the smallest nation? How did he know we will be spread all over the world? And one more thing, he said, whenever I'm going to spread you, the goyim around you will never give you a rest. They'll never leave you. Never leave you. Always anti-Semitism, pogrom, holocaust, problem, all kinds of problems. And what else does it say? Ve'aita shama lemashal leshnina. But everyone, at, on the other hand, will admire you 
and you will be the focus of everything. The smallest country in the world, Israel, the smallest nation in the world, the Jews, no nation in history, anyone spoke about even 1% of what people speak in average day about Israel and the Jews. People in some islands that are not aware of the geographical map, they think that Israel is the size of Russia. I met people like this in my life, because they hear about it so much everywhere they go. They're not imagining that Israel is smaller than New Jersey or the size of Toronto. They're, they're not imagining such thing. Country that always on the news, this, army, politician, all over the world. Number one prize winner, uh, Nobel Prize winners, the Jews. No nation in a history contributed to culture, to finance, to science, to wisdom more than the Jews. In the United States, there are 6 million Jews and more than 350 million Goyim. The number of the doctors in America are 50% Jews, 50% non-Jews. 6 million contributed, what 350 million contributed. 6 million, 350. Same thing lawyers, same thing judges. The biggest billionaires in the world are Jews in relation to their number in the world. For every hundred Jews in the world, you have the highest number of wealthy people and more very successful. Every field in the world, the Jews are always dominate and they always been and they will always be. The Torah say, the Jews are the center of the world. They are my children. I chose you from all the nation to be my children. It's a verse in the Torah. Even the Goim admit it. Many, many times in the past, I heard Goim Christians say, you are the chosen people. And they speak about us as the chosen people. The Torah called God the God of Israel, not the God of the Palestinians, not the God of the Arabs, not the God of the Chinese. Why not the God of the Chinese? They are the biggest nation in the world. No. The God of Israel. I am the God of Israel. I am Hashem Elokei Israel. Right? So what do we see? That we have a special relationship with God. The problem is that we constantly betray Him. Why we betrayed him? He told us in the Torah, after he gave us the Torah 3,320 years ago, he gave us the Torah and he said that the foundation of Judaism is observing the Sabbath. He said, I created the world in six days and in the seventh day I rested. Therefore, I want each one of you to be like me, like a little God. I made the world in six days. You do everything you want in six days. Seven days holy. It's coming out of the physical world. It's a spiritual day. Every material has six dimensions. South, west, east, and north. Up and down, together six. Seven symbolize going out of the material world to a place where there's no time. Time exists only where material exists. As Albert Einstein said, and got lots of credit for his discovery, when in reality the Ramban, 700 years before him, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, wrote it clearly in his books. But nobody learns about the Rambam in college. So the, part, the ones who goes to college heard about Albert Einstein, but they never heard about Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman from Spain, who eventually went to Israel and to the city of Akko. So we see here that material, time exists only where material exists. And the seven days symbolize the spiritual world, what comes in the afterlife, the life of eternity, when the soul, the divine soul that are in the body, which is a spark of God, will separate from the body and go back to the court of heaven for a trial of one year, one year trial. And in that year, a person will be judged for the time he became Bar Mitzvah until the time of his death. Every event, every word, every step, Every move, every transaction that he did for good or for bad, he will receive his reward or God forbid his punishment. Just as the Torah promised, no surprises. He may come and say, I didn't know. I grew up in Russia, my parents never told me, they didn't know. I grew up in a kibbutz, nobody said about it. Every Jew has an opportunity or more in his life to discover the truth. All of you now sitting in front of the big screen over there in Toronto, maybe it's the first opportunity God gave you in your life. Maybe it's the second, maybe it's the tenth. I don't know any one of you. But I want to tell you one thing, that there's no guarantee there will be another opportunity. The fact that he puts you to hear this, 
it's enough. Of course, in one, one and a half hours, it's very hard to make a case. But my next thing to you is, you don't have to believe me today. I just gave you enough material to think, to start use your head. Maybe he's right. Just think about one thing. If I'm wrong, then you live your life. You eat, I eat. You play, I play. You sleep, I sleep. You have a wife, I have a wife. You have children, I have children. You dress nice, I dress nice. You live in a nice house, I live in a nice house. You drive a car, I drive a car. You have a watch, I have a watch. You basically have nothing more than me in your life. But you live in a lie, completely against God. When later the bill will be served to you, you'll be very miserable. Because you'll be very, very shocked that you have to now pay for all that. Now, if I'm right, if you're right, we are even. You die one day, I die. We both enjoy our life. But if I'm right, I won big time, and you lost big time. So the minimum intelligence requires that you, you read the Torah once in your life. There's hardly any Jew in the world, and I'm talking from 18 years of experience, that read the Torah once in his life. There's not, I didn't find one secular Jew who read the Torah from the beginning to the war, to the end, with a simple explanation. The, the, just the literal explanation of the words. Not talking the Midrashim, the Kabbalah, the mystical part of it, the secrets. None of it. I'm just talking the meaning of the words. Why does it say this, like that? Why God call himself one time this name and sometimes in another name? And the events and what happened and what's the meaning of every mitzvah, the 613 commandments. 248 organs in the body, 248 positive mitzvot, 365 ligaments in the body, 365 restriction, and they all link together. Ligament per restriction, organ per positive commandment. Just like the shape of the soul, just like the shape of the body, everything has a deep meaning. So all I'm saying to you is, you don't have to be convinced in one, one and a half hour. No. But all you have to think is, there is a 1% chance that this guy is right. And we both know there's much more than that. There's 1% chance that he's right. And if he's right, it's going to be a, an eternal disaster for me. Because I go every day of my life against God. And he will never forgive me, because the Torah is very strict about the punishments. So why should I put myself in a jeopardy? Let me investigate, let me learn, let me dedicate a few hours, a few days of my life to, to investigate. Either he will convince me 100% that the Torah is divine and I have to change and win big time for eternity, or I will be convinced 100% that he's a liar and a faker and the Torah is full of baloney, one of the two. It's not in between. Well, how long does it take? between one day to seven days. That's how it's going to be. A seminar that we make today takes two and a half days. Usually by the first day of the seminar, everyone is already convinced. Almost everybody. Maximum the second day. You don't even need a seminar. All you have to do is to watch my film, Torah and Science. Four hours. It's divided to three parts. Part one, part two, part three. Three different subjects connected together, Torah and Science. You can dedicate Four hours of your life. And if you find out that the Torah is divine, as I promise you, you will after watching this film, the question is, what are you going to do with this amazing information you just gained? Are you going to live for the rest of your life in a lie and close your eyes from the truth and ignore it and convince yourself that everything will be fine, but it won't be fine and only get worse? Or you're going to start slowly, slowly, slowly but surely to make adjustments in your life. Which means, if you don't have mezuzah, so you put mezuzah. You start putting tefillin two, three minutes a day. You pray once a day. You need three times. Once. You start with once. You start watching what you eat, what you don't eat. You're making some easy changes to begin with. When God sees that you start making changes, of course He's going to help you. You're His son. You're His daughter. Children of God, he's interested that we ought to listen to him, that he should give us the reward. In case you have a doubt, the Torah says, I am strict with you, I'm testing you to see what's in your heart. Do you love me or not? And another place it says in the Torah, I'm already translating to English. It says, I am 
the God, the zealous God, the zealous God, I'm testing you to see, will you keep my mitzvot or not? He's going to keep my orders or not? And what comes right after that, the next verse? To reward you in your end. Why I'm doing you? Why I'm doing this test? Why am I testing you? Well, it's a game? No. It's a test because when you pass the test, you will earn your reward. That's the way I designed the world. It's a place of a test. You pass the test in a high score, you win big time. You, you pass it in a small score, you win, but not such big time. You fail, you pay the price. You don't show up to the test, you pay even harder price. Why? You cannot run away from me. I'm God, I'm your creator. I give you oxygen, I give you water, I give you your house, I give you your wife, I give you your money, everything you have. Every breath you take is thanks to me. I'm tired of you, all I have to do is close your nostrils for one, two minutes and you're over. So basically every breath we take, it's not for free. We are in the middle of a test and we have to prove that we're worth it. The problem is that 80%, 70% of the Jews have no idea what they live for. You ask them what you live for, to make money, to be successful. So why 90% of the people in the world are poor? Are poor? Then someone else will tell you to be healthy. Most people are sick in some kind of a sickness. Uh, to get married, you know how many single, many millions are singles or divorced, etc. To have children, you know, 15% of the Jews are barren. That's the statistic. Whatever you're going to say, I'll prove you wrong right away. And no one in the world can prove that it's better to be a human being than a chimpanzee or a dog. Because the animals have a much better life than us. They're stronger, they're healthier, they're free. They don't have to work 30 years to buy a house. They don't have to make all the shots to get their wives to agree to marry them. It's right away. They don't have to raise children. They're born ready. They run away. Five minutes later, they begin to run. Their life is much, much easier. Nobody tells them what to do. They don't have any stress. You never find a chimpanzee with gray hair or bald. They don't have the agony and the pain that people have. So what do we see here? That if God wanted us to enjoy this place, it would make us birds or monkeys or anyone else with no work, no problem, no sicknesses, no pain, no nothing, no suffering. Rather, the Torah say the opposite. The Torah say life is full of suffering, full of tests, full of challenges. What am I doing? I'm torturing you to see what's in your heart. Will you stay faithful to me or you betrayed me? Why is it? Because I'm going to reward you and your children for eternity. Somebody asks you, prove to me in the Torah, how do we know there's life after death or there's life of eternity like you always claim? So this is the verse. I will reward you. So listen to me. I will benefit. I will reward you and your children for eternity. Eternity means trillions of years. It's not even the beginning. It's endless. Endless reward. And in case you wonder, what kind of reward is that? playing basketball, swimming in a pool, what kind of pleasure? The answer is pure, pure spiritual ple pleasure. The spiritual pleasure that we have today here is mixed with physical, physical obstacle. The body always resists. The body doesn't let you go to learn Torah, to listen, to, because the body has its own desires. Once the soul is separate from the body, it's pure receiving pure spiritual pleasure, but not just spiritual, divine spiritual pleasure. Divine. It's the highest ultimate level of pleasure that a person can dream of. Not for a year or 70 years. Forever and ever. In heaven, in a place called heaven. Souls only, no bodies. Unbelievable pleasure. The Torah says, there is a question in the Torah. How come God made it very clear to us what's happening in hell? That's where the wicked people get punished after they die. Like Auschwitz, fires, suffering, people are screaming, all kinds of horrible things. But he did not describe to us exactly what happened in heaven. So the Torah say, trying to explain to people here in a physical body, 
what's the pleasure in heaven? It's like trying to explain a blind person what the color blue is. You can never explain to him colors, because he never saw colors. So you try to tell him, you know, blue, it's like the sky. You say, what's the sky? Uh, it's similar to green. What's green? It's very relaxing. How is it relaxing? Nobody understands, because he doesn't have it in his, his computer, in his brain. He, does, he cannot imagine what exactly blue or red is. So the Torah says like this, if you take all the pleasure of all the people, of all the generations, combine whatever, food, vacation, money, ma eh, women, anything you can think of, art, hobbies, any possible pleasure of every person ever lived here, not the seven, eight billion that lives here today, Everyone who ever lived here from Adam until today, every person, men, women, children, combine all the pleasure they ever had will not be equal to one hour of the pleasure of one Jew in the afterlife. One hour, one person in the afterlife greater than this entire world combined. Where does it say it? It says, Yafa, Sha'a Achat. של קורת רוח בעולם הבא מכל חיי העולם הזה. One hour in the afterlife of pleasure is greater than this entire world combined. That's divine words. It's not an Israeli uh, Knesset member that promised pleasure and two days after the election he doesn't remember who you are or in the Congress. This is uh, the creator of the world that testifies himself that is the ultimate justice. I will never receive bribe, nobody can bribe him, I will give everyone exactly what they deserve. So you may ask me, well, we don't really see the divine justice in the world. We see dictators, very bad people, they live, they control, they have money, they enjoy life, and they make a lot of people miserable and nothing happens to them. And then on the other hand, we see people learn Torah, doing good things, and they have cancer, problems, die young, sicknesses, aggravation. All kinds of opposites. What's happening here? The answer is the Torah says that the wicked people, since everyone does some good in his life, God say, Ani el ha'emet ve'atzedek, I am the God of the, the truth of the, and the justice, asher lo isa panim velo ikach shochad. I will not prefer anyone and will not receive bribe. Ani el kana, I am a zealous God, משלם לשונאי אל פניו לאבידו. I'm paying my enemies cash to their face to get rid of them. I will not delay the reward. I will pay them in their face. אל פניו אשלם לו לאבידו. I will destroy them by making this limited payment that I owe them here in this temporary world, that I don't have to give them anything in the afterlife which is eternity. That's why the wicked people celebrate here, control the politics, the media, etc. But the righteous people, I delay and postpone their eternal reward. I don't want to pay them in a temporary place. That's why when they die, their souls will receive all the rewards. Now I want to ask you a question. People say, the Torah say that someone who doesn't keep Shabbat has to be executed to death. But we see that many people drive on Shabbat, the Torah says, Lo teva ruash bechol moshvotechem, and they're not dying. Some of them live 80, 90 years old. So where is the justice? The Torah says, Mechalel Shabbat has to be put to death. It's a sentence in the Torah, I did not write the Torah. The Torah says, Mechalel Shabbat, mot yumat, mot ba'olam hazeh, yumat la'olam haba, will be die from this world and to the next world. You lose both worlds, die younger here, and will die for the life of eternity as no share to the world to come. So how come some people drive and smoke and everything is fine and they're not dying? The answer is, if every time a person will make a sin, right away gets the punishment. For instance, you have 10 Jews sitting in Shabbat, they want to smoke their cigarettes. So the first one who light the cigarette, boom, it explodes in his face and he died. So people thought maybe it's a bad cigarette. So somebody else like a cigarette, boom, explode and he died. From this moment on, no one in the history ever will dare to light a cigarette on Shabbat, ever. Everyone will make sure that his children will know 
be careful, you light a cigarette, you die. So nobody will have a test. Who will be Mechalel Shabbat? If every time you start the car, you explode. If every time you light a fire, you explode. If every time you steal, right away you lose double. Or the other way around. If every time you give donation, right away you make double. If everyone, uh, you, you, every time you keep Shabbat, right away you make a million dollars. Of course everyone will be righteous. Where is the test? Even the, the, the biggest monster in history will give donation to the yeshiva. Because it's a very good business. You double your money right away. So the answer is, the idea of a test is the timing of the reward and the timing of the punishment. God says, I decide when and where the reward and the punishment will take place. It's not instant. If it would be instant, there is no test. It eliminates the free choice. If every person would be afraid to make a mistake because the right is going to die, nobody will make sins. No one will dare to, to steal because right away you lose double. It's enough you stole once and you lost double never to repeat that mistake. The idea is that you have a book of instruction. You got it from God. It says over there you should not steal. You steal, you're going to lose double. When? I'll decide. Next month, next year, in 20 years. So the idea is that, oh, I just stole and I got away with that. Oh, I just lit a cigarette and I got away with that. Oh, I just hurt someone's feeling. I got away with that. You get away with that in your dream, in your imagination, yes. In reality, nobody can fool God. And remember one more thing, and then I'll give you some time for questions right now. No one in history ever lost by eliminate his own wishes and surrender to God's orders. No one. For instance, a person has a business and he makes good money on Shabbat. No one, no one ever lost by closing the business, even though he makes less money now every week. But no one in the long run can ever lose a penny for listening to what God told him, especially when his wish was the opposite. He wanted to open on Shabbat because he makes money. But he eliminated his free choice and he did what God told him. For that, it's going to get a huge reward. Is it possible to think that a person is sacrificing for his creator to listen to his, to his instruction and his orders? For that, the, the, the creator of the world will give you bad for the good? Or well, is ungrateful? Even we, I asked somebody this week, I told him, tell me, if I would do a big favor to you and I save your life, would you appreciate me or you want to stick a knife in my back? So of course I would appreciate you for the rest of my life. So I asked him a question. I said, let's take a Hamas terrorist. If he was about to die, he's drowning in a lake, and I ran and I jumped and I took him out and I saved his life. Tomorrow when he comes to murder all the people in my synagogue and he sees me, do you think he's going to shoot me? Or he's going to say, you can go out? So he says, he's probably going to let you go. I said, this is a, one of the biggest monsters in, in the world, that murdering children. Why he didn't kill me? Because when he saw he was about to shoot me, he remembered that uh, two months ago I saved him from drowning in a lake. So I told that person, who was a doctor, I told him, tell me now, Mr. Doctor, do you think God is worse than a Hamas terrorist that murdered children? That's your opinion about God? I said, no, God forbid. Why you say such a thing? I said, because you think that by you listening to God, you're going to lose money. How can it be? He told you, I will bless you in everything you do, thanks to this mitzvah. So why are you thinking you're going to lose? So he started to say, you know, you're right. There's no logical explanation. Because we only understand immediate results, immediate outcome. But that's not what the Torah said. The Torah said there is a test. And the reward and the punishment is yet to come. For sure. No question. Always. When? We don't know. He decides when and where and how. But remember one more thing, you can never ever lose by listening to the instruction of Torah. Torah means Torah in Hebrew, Torah, instructions. If you have any doubt about the Torah, all you have to do is watch my film, Torah and Science, that's it. You watch it, pay attention to every proof there, pay attention to part one, part two, part three, to the end, and it will help you to start a new life. I want to open the, the microphone now there, if you can, and... Uh, if anyone has questions for me, now it's the time to ask.
<laughs> I hear clapping over there, but I don't, uh, I can't actually see a picture yet. Yeah, open me the, yeah, this, that I can also see the audience there. Now I can see you, very good. Okay, so anybody has a question or everything was clear? What's going on there? No, I see, I see you very clear. I see you very clear, so go ahead. Yes. We're talking about uh, me coming, hopefully next month I come physically to Toronto, we can organize a lecture. If all of you will help together, we can do one night over That's there. Hashem, I'd like to take the mitzvah to do it, and uh, it's funny, Rabbi, you know, sometimes I see Hashem and everything, and I listen to you, and my, my conscious, you want to do what Hashem is well, you know what's a met, his Torah is a met, but uh, you know, you see the, the, the your, your face, you're going hair, you're older, you have white in the beard, it's the old man. Shave it, there's a part of you that feels bad, but like you say, nothing happens. You feel bad, it goes away. Uh, something happens where you get stressed from work, and, and you're, then all of a sudden you appear, Hashem, you go right to the forest, Hashem, help me, please help me. Then he helps you, and then you forget, time forgets. Somebody will show me a it takes one second, two months later, and you fall, and, and then what do I do? And, and, you know, I, I don't want to have to be scared to pray to Hashem and to do what Hashem wants, you know, in order to do well. I want to feel what I feel now all the time when Hashem is, you know, when I, when I, when I feel secure and, and I don't feel like Hashem is upset with me, you know, but I see that everything is from Hashem and it's a smooth rabbi and I'm going to finish here, that I'm here, that I have you in front of me, like, I thank you, Kedosh Baruch Hu, Edith Pabim, Hashem, your name should be blessed, Edith Pabim, to give me this food, because it's only thanks to you, Hashem, Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes, yes.
you just you know you just you just helped me you You know what, I, I, I want to tell you, you know, you just helped me to prove what I always tell people for thousands of time, what's the power of one CD. When a person receives CD, there's more than a 50% chance to save his soul forever. And you see, you got the CD and you changed your life and now you're organizing this evening and maybe Bezrat Hashem will come in a few weeks there and more people will come. It's always a chain reaction, the power of one CD. Very good. Okay, so guys, if anyone else has more questions, if not, we'll see you soon, Bezrat Hashem. Any more questions or no? Anyone else has more questions? Okay, go ahead. Yes, yes, hi. Okay, thank you. Oh, I said, um, I'm not sure if you remember me, but I was one of your students in my class. Yes, yes. And when, when you shared Bezat Hashem, the Bezat Hashem student was in Thornhill, which is a block, uh, literally two blocks away from the Kiva Center. Very good. I arranged something there, Bezat Hashem. I've been there like 15 times already. Now it's time. I'd love it for you to be in our home. No, so we will. Feel like, you know, the Moroccan and Ashkenazi home, yeah? Very good, very good. Soon, soon, Bezrat Hashem, in a few weeks. Rabbi, yeah. sorry, this is, that was my wife. I just have one more question. How come during your whole shiur, I don't know why, but I, 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 I'm usually a strong character guy, but I, uh, I feel like uh, the cry, the whole, the whole shiur. No, because the soul, the soul is listening, the conscience, the musar, that shows that the soul is good, is pure. And a person feels like crying when he makes tshuva, when he listens to words of Torah, it's a very good indication. You can be a very big tzaddik. All you need is to want to be and to learn Torah. And if you do it, nobody can stop you from it. And that's, that's basically 90% of the people. All they have to do is make a decision and work very hard and they'll do it. All right, guys. Yeah. The satan is... The, you, you, you know, the satan is a job. He's trying to prevent repentance and Torah. That's his job. And it's always got difficult. It's always got difficult. Oh, I, it was great uh, pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you very much, Haviv, also. Thank you very much. All the best. Shalom.